a recording later. Hello to you as well. I'm Natasha. I'm one of the solution engineers in VMware Tanzu team. And our mission here at uh, Tanzu is making the developer experience seamless uh, as much as we can. And there's a bunch of things happening out of Tanzu. So I definitely uh, say uh, watch out for VMware Tanzu um, and just Google us, uh, look us up. Um, within that space, um, we have a new product called Tanzu Application Platform, um, which is a bunch of other things, but um, one of the core pieces to it is the supply chain, is where we address the CI CD um, pains that you feel today. And um, it's based on top of an open source project called Cartographer. And Cartographer essentially is, um, um, uh, let's let's look at, okay, let me start off. So um, what is Cartographer's dictionary? Uh, it's, it is a person who draws or produces maps and cartographer, uh, the open source project is just doing that. It maps your path to prod. It is a choreographer that allows you to create a secure supply chain, which is reusable for all of your applications and defines your CI CD, all of the CI CD in one place um, or ties all of your CI CD in one place, let's say. Um, now, I did say cartographer is choreographer. Uh, what is choreography? So choreography entails establishing a pattern where uh, a series of steps or phases occur uh, without requiring supervision or instruction. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us are pretty familiar with orchestrators and uh, if you're here, trying to solve any problem you know or uh, must have heard about orchestrators. So I'm going to try to place this here and now let's talk about what an orchestrator is and I'm going to try to zoom in here. So um, orchestrator and choreographer, let's just talk about literally what an orchestrator is. It Think about is an orchestra and there's a conductor. The orchestrator is that conductor. It's uh, all the all the orchestra knows what piece of music, how to play, what to do. They know everything, but they still look for the conductor to pass on the instruction to play that piece. And then everything is a symphony. You can uh, the music is beautiful, uh, but you have that dependency on that central conductor. Then quite quite equivalent to that would be uh, a choreographer. So choreographer also uh, sets a pattern on who dances first, what is the front row, how they dance, and then how all the movements are placed. But when the performance happens, uh, you don't need the choreographer to you know, kind of have the dance play out. So that's that's on a high level the difference and pretty much the difference in how an orchestrator uh, typically would play out the CI CD. It would have some steps. Uh, it's a mono system. It's dependent on that central source. If there is, if uh, and now in the context of CI CD, if there is an external trigger to the system, it has it's supposed to always go through the orchestrator, which would trigger internal know what steps to trigger. And then there will be a whole bunch of uh, scripting that happens that would lead or uh, integrate between the different uh, steps in the pipeline. So that's how, uh, uh, or how I think that's a way to look at orchestrators. And then in choreography is you declare, it's a declarative uh, format where you uh, declare the steps, you decouple them and you just uh, in the declaration say, this step is dependent on this step prior to this, but it does not, like every step is an in, independent 
phase in the CI/CD pipeline. So you don't always need the choreographer to be the one to trigger things. So let's say there is a CI/CD system where the security scan is a phase and there is a new vulnerability or a new CVE that got detected. In an orchestrator, it would look like the CVE scanning would need a trigger to the, uh, to the pipeline and then each step of the pipeline in the mono system will get executed. Uh, drawing a parallel, and uh, there is no parallel to it in our in choreographer, but what happens when uh, external CVE gets triggered? In that case, that CVE goes in and directly impacts the phase, which is a security scanning phase, and that triggers that that phase to trick to get executed, and all the subsequent steps from security scan onwards will get. Uh, triggered. So that's that's the core difference. So there is no like single point of start uh, in a, in a uh, choreography system. Um, and there is no uh, tight coupling of the different phases. Uh, the phases are all asynchronous and event-based. So with that, I just thought we can maybe dig a little deeper into Sorry about that. I got in my way. Okay, so um, so that's that's again um, your CI/CD pipeline with that central orchestrator. Examples of orchestrators would be Jenkins, Tekton, um, Circle CI. Like those tools that are out there, uh, they effectively create a pipeline where you define the step one, two, three, four, five, um, and that's what uh, this would look like. Now, since it's also tightly coupled, if you were to swap out and uh, let's look at this uh, particular pipeline uh, where there's a uh, Git observer, some steps in a tecton pipeline, then building with KPAC, uh, then scanning and then deploying. So that's how a typical pipeline would look like or a CI CD uh, workflow would look like. So in an orchestrator environment, it would be super hard to sort of swip, swap out tools. And why do I say that? Because uh, the orchestrator is the one who kind of knows the integrations between the, the previous step and the step after. So we'd have to make changes to that central orchestrator to be able to, um, to, be able to uh, accommodate a new change. So if you were to use a new build tool, you'd have to go in and make a change. And since it's pipelines there, and we all know there's pipelines over pipelines over pipelines, and think of it at, at scale, that, that just gets um, like a lot to manage. And, uh, and it is like a rigid flow that you have to go through. So I was going to this. So now we are at a scale problem with the orchestrator. So this is Dev team A, uh, B and C. Everybody wants to do their own thing. And uh, we have created this uh, pipeline sp uh, sprawl and switching anything out here is a nightmare. And uh, you have to, so just like we talked, if there is a CVE that needs to be fixed in the base OS of the of the image that you created, you'd have to kind of you'd have to kind of trigger a dummy commit into uh, your Git to be able to even trigger the whole the whole pipeline. So with all that said, uh, there is an one there is an inconsistent path to prod then there is no separation of concerns. Uh, the dev teams can, can get in and write their own pipelines. Sometimes I've seen dev teams at our customers uh, just having like super short uh, pipelines and just skipping the image scanning stuff. Uh, they All they care about is, okay, uh, the bare minimum, I need to uh, do a source scan, I need to do, uh, container creation of sorts, and then deploy. They don't look at image scanning. They don't look at all of those things. Uh, and maybe even in some cases, there's no 
testing uh, that's part of the pipeline. So there, there is all these inconsistencies in the path to prod, uh, which uh, we believe that uh, security should be front and center uh, with as we are getting into this container space, uh, we need to make sure what goes, how it's running, and uh, that there are no known CVEs, we address at least those. Um, so with, with this, uh, let's look at how cartographer is like trying to solve this problem. Like what would happen uh, or what would it, what does cartographer do to address these problem. So let's uh, switch over to, uh, to cartographer. Again, um, what cartographer does is you have these steps or um, phases in your CICD flow. Um, the first st stage essentially being watch some, side, uh, some sort of a repo, then do a source scan, build, image scan, test, deploy. So those are your phases. Uh, typically, there'd be like, uh, different implementations of each of these. Uh, with Cartographer, what we have done is we've introduced a Kubernetes uh, CRD um, called templates. So there's like five different type of templates and you could choose what template to use based on what would be the output from that phase in your CICD flow. So if the first one's uh, output is a source, then you'd use a, a source template. Here, uh, here you'd use an image template. Then there's, uh, if there's no output, you just uh, have a success or a failure, then you just uh, run a bare template. And then there is a deployment template. So all of those templates, essentially what they're trying to do is um, abstract away the complexity of the tool that you're using. So if you are using KPAC, I'd, uh, I, I'd use an image template, which would abstract away the KPAC, uh, the KPAC object or the CRD within that template. And we'll look at it when I demo it. So this is just getting the constructs across and then we'll look at all of that uh, in my demo later. So you'd put the K pack inside the template and the template, uh, you essentially define what is the source or like what is the input and what's the output uh, in, in that. And once you've done all of the templates and you've said, this is the input, this is the output, how do you make these templates work together? That's where you'd uh, use one of the blueprints. Um, the blueprint is called cluster supply chain again, another CRD, uh, which gets deployed to your Kubernetes cluster uh, when you install Cartographer. Um, and now with cluster supply chain is where you define all of these resources. You define the relationship between uh, the source template, the scanning template, uh, uh, or not the scanning, the source template. And this one again is a source template. And then you'd use an image template here. Uh, again, an, another image template. Uh, a bare template and a deploy template. So this, this is how you define that blueprint, uh, defining what goes in and what output to expect and define the relationship of watches. So all of these uh, templates essentially are uh, spinning out Kubernetes objects and the central cartographer controller is is monitoring or is controlling each of these controllers. So we've defined uh, the template and when the developer interfaces with this uh, supply chain, all he gets to do is work with a, uh, with a um, workflow YAML. So let's, let's look at this. So we've created this supply chain. And remember the supply chain would be owned and written by a DevOps or a SecOps person. Um, uh, they would basically, we say SecOps and we 
want the security to have a say in these supply chains that are getting written to be reused across uh, the organization. So, so security needs to get in there and be part of the supply chains. So, so once that is created, now this is the definition that uh, you'd put in the cluster or the DevOps, uh, DevSecOps team would put in the cluster. Uh, what happens now, how does the developer uh, use the CI CD uh, cluster supply chain that you've created? So they will come up with, uh, there is another CI, uh, CRD. So essentially there's like three high level CRDs, there's templates, there's blueprint, which is the cluster supply chain, and then there's the workload. So those three, uh, and that's it. So the developer uses a workload YAML, which you think is like a super compressed version of a deployment. Uh, and all they do is refer to what developers work with. So in that uh, workload YAML, they would uh, specify what is the code, uh, where is the code, what is the Git URL look like, what is uh, the Git branch look like, and then uh, give a selector of what or which supply chain to use. There could be several supply chains uh, based on different teams trying to do different phases in, uh, in their lower environment or their uh, prod environment. And, or there could be just different tools that each of these teams decided to use. Or, if the DevSecOps teams can get everything in a single supply chain, that's kudos to them. But um, the idea is to get as fewer of these as possible. So I look at it as going from uh, maybe hundreds and thousands of pipelines to maybe in the tens or two digit supply chains in a large enterprise, which which has like over 500 developers working with the system. So now, uh, once again, I hope we got it across. I got it across um, um, all the benefits that you see from Cartographer. One would be the flexibility of it, the, the ability to like switch out what tool to use, uh, the reusability of how the developer just interfaces at that level. They don't have to create pipelines. They don't have to deal with any of that. They are just uh, using a super compressed version of a YAML to interface with the system. Uh, definitely there's a separation of concern. Uh, modularity is there and consistency across the board. Um, with that said, uh, if there are any question, I can pause for a minute here, try to Try to answer some. I, uh, I see none, but I'll carry on. Um, well, feel free to put your questions in there. Okay, so in the demo, what will, uh, here's like, we talked about all that, and I think we need to see how of it now. Uh, what I'm going to do is create like a basic uh, flow. Um, I would go from a source to image to deployment. Uh, I'd show in the stage one how uh, this would happen in if you were doing it manually by means of CRDs, uh, by directly accessing the CRDs for these tools uh, that we are gonna use. Um, in stage two, we'd look at the templated versions. And then finally, stage three, we'd look at uh, the cartographer uh, parameterized templates and supply chain. And then of, of course, along the way, we'd try to go uh, look under the hood, what's going on and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's get started and So I'm going to use Fluxd for uh, watching of the Git. I'm just in this example going to use Kpack as my tool to build images, and then Knative Service uh, as my deployment tool. And uh, there's uh, all of these YAMLs that. Let 
maybe I'm not in the right directory. So the first one here is the Flux CD um, object or uh, that you'd get, create. Uh, you'd specify what Git, Git branch, what URL, what's the interval to pull and all of that good stuff in here. Uh, then you define a KPAC image, um, which would uh, take in the source from the Flux CD execution and uh, spit out uh, the image to this location here. And uh, finally, the service, uh, again, the service object would, uh, the service object would uh, take the input from the, the KPAC uh, CRD that we just ran. So with, uh, with that said, I, let's just apply uh, some of this and see how it would look like. Okay, and I can do a get on that. So this creates the FlexCD object. And if I look at the object, what it's doing is it pulled from, uh, it pulled from the repo and then it created a zip file and pushed in that location. So what I need to do in the next step is I need to get into my uh, uh, KPAC object. I need to supply this URL over there. And at this time, I'm going to apply an object. So my image object is created. I can uh, so it takes a few minutes here to uh, run, but I wanted to show the uh, Online YAML, how it looks like. So at this time, it's creating the first build. It's saying it's executing, and um, either I can wait for it to come back with the status, or um, since I'm using KPAC, the KPAC CLI itself allows me to uh, get in here, look at the logs for the run um, running build. So this is, uh, a, I think, let, let's say an Easter egg for you guys on what KPAC is about, look it up, another uh, awesome tool in creating um, your containers. You don't have, now you don't need your developers to write those Docker files and be responsible for managing the do Docker files. Every time there's a CV, you're swapping some layer out. So none of that is your developer's responsibility. It's get uh, taken care by KPAC. So all it does is it, uh, we were just looking at it, it analyzes the different phases. In the phases, it knows, okay, this is a Java project and it's a Spring Boot project. So I need all of these build packs and it'll apply those build packs and uh, create that container for you. Now, with that said, uh, I can now run the object since the build is complete and I can get the latest image out of my image object. And this in turn is what I'll use for editing my delivery object, right? So we just saw that uh, YAML. So we are going to do that. And Knative is another open source. Uh, you can um, 
use it uh, as well. It has it's an event based architecture again for deployments. Um, and goes from code to URL with just uh, that Knative service deployment. So I can get this going and in a minute it would come up with my URL unless it's still trying to create it. Yeah, there's my URL. Okay, so that's, that's, but it's all manual. So there wasn't anything uh, that ha happened automatically for us here. And, um, and that's the whole problem, right? You, you would write an orchestrator script, which would say this step, then look at that YAML, watch the object, look at uh, the YAML extract, put it somewhere. It's a bunch of scripting within the scope of that scripting uh, or your orchestrating tool. You do that versus uh, what cartographer does is uses the native uh, Kubernetes object and layers on top of it and uses the Kubernetes native uh, controllers and watchers to uh, extract this information out. So now uh, with that done, the next step, like I said, would be templating this. So let's move on to the templating part. Um, before we get there, uh, I told you there was a bunch of templates that are available. And that's how I'd like to show you all these templates that there that are out there, um, which cartographer install. There's a cluster config. So if you're spitting out a configuration of sorts, you'd use that template. If you're spitting out a deployment, that would be the template. It's If it's an image, that would be the template. Uh, if it's a runnable uh, or a task that needs to be executed and still needs some kind of uh, scripting uh, in it, you can use that template. And uh, finally, the source and the bare template. The bare template is essentially do a step, but there is no output from it. So that's uh, that's what it would look like. And let's look at each uh, of the three um, uh, templates that we had to create for this very basic flow that we are doing, going from the source to image to deployment. So that's the first template. Uh, um, I'm using the cluster source template and um, it's a Git tree again. So everything that we had in the Flux CD object that we saw earlier is uh, still here. Uh, it just goes in and sits inside the template object. So we have that. And then in the spec, we just define where in the spec would have find the URL. So uh, it is under the status, the artifact and URL, just what we had extracted. Uh, if you remember when we were doing the Flux CD, I can go back. So you see that we did that status, the status dot URL uh, on the Flux CD object. And that's exactly what we are defining would be the output. Uh, from this particular phase in in the workflow, and similarly, the uh, the image template looks pretty similar to this. Uh, there's an opportunity to use either a template, which is hard coded, or uh, like here, or be able to use um, templating tools. So you could instead of a hard coded template, you could use YTT, uh, another um, tool out there to, it's a YAML templating tool essentially. And then you can parameterize what gets spit out from this. Um, but in this case, I'm just using a template. Um, again, the, that KPAC object sits here. All I say is that parameter to from where to pull uh, the, the URL for this phase is defined here. And we'll see how all of this gets connected in that blueprint. And finally, um, sorry about that. 
the taskbar decided to mess with me. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the cluster. This is a cluster template. It does not spit out anything. It just deploys and moves along. Uh, but the input is from that images um, template that we created right before this. And final step would be to look at this. Uh, we to look at this supply chain. So how did we this all get put together? So this is a basic source to URL supply chain that we created. Uh, these are the resources. Again, it's an array uh, of objects. Uh, the first one being uh, the source. So we had created this source using the Flux CD um, CRD uh, in the template. Could be anything else if you wanted to switch out as long as it is able to provide you that URL of the blob, it's all good. So, um, so we define here, we, we define parameters. If we have to pass, there's an opportunity to pass parameters to the templates. Um, we could pass it uh, through, through the params object in this YAML in the spec file. And then the second resource here is the image builder. And when you are in that image builder, I reference to source. So this source would essentially be an input to this image builder phase. Uh, and that input refers to the source builder. So this is that source builder. So this is how we are connecting uh, the image to the output from the first phase. And if you notice already, the sources is an area again. So uh, these uh, the supply chain that you build are no longer linear. So if you needed uh, an image build step to trigger based on um, multiple branches, maybe uh, or multiple pieces of code that you are watching, so you could put both of those as sources here, and it would just trigger. Um, the image phase or the, or the image creation phase for you. And, um, <clears throat> and then the deployer would uh, reference the images from the image builder phase that you defined in the supply chain. So that's it, that's all it takes. Uh, the crucial bit would be the selector and the selector is what you define this workload type. So essentially, if now there is a developer who wants to go in and start using uh, this supply chain, they'd have to create that workload YAML and in that workload YAML say, uh, my workload type is basic. So essentially meaning I want to use the, uh, this particular supply chain versus something else that could be running in the system. So that said, uh, this uh, we can now move on to like the more end-to-end -end parameterized versions of uh, all of this. We'll first look at uh, the parameterized versions for the source and the image. Um, so. You see, now I'm starting to reference uh, the parameters from the workload YAML. So the workload which is getting executed, I'm going to be able to pick information out of that and spit it out here and be able to stamp out these custom objects for each of the workload that uh, tries to utilize this supply chain. Again, uh, I, I think I did bring this up that there was an opportunity to use YTT. That's the YAML templating tool. If you wanted to do some advanced uh, YAML templating, like conditional patching of the template, you could use uh, YTT and just do that. And this, I just did this to be able to uh, respond that point that there is an option to do that. The, the final thing or the supply chain here would look something like this. And I'm going to bring uh, a VS, VS code here would look uh, would look like this. Essentially, no difference is just the same uh, supply chain. But the deployment objects get I'm using 
not the plain K native. I'm using cap controller. And again, this is just for you to be able to see that you could use any type of deployment. This could be an Argo deployment, Argo CD deployment at this point, uh, or uh, could be with cap controller. That's another um, tool from VMware under the Carvel umbrella. So there's YTT, CAP, both belong to the Carvel tool suite. Are pretty neat. I like to use them all the time. And that's what I'm using. And again, this is to uh, impress upon that point that if you were wanting to do uh, some Argo CD based deployment, you could just do that right here. And Argo CD would take over from from, from here and the pipeline would just spit out an Argo CD based object. Let's go back to our terminal um, and try to create that for first workload. I did that. I wanted to also like sort of watch what happens when I'm running the workload. So this is my workload that I created. Again, I can by queue it. Well, it on the right hand side you can see that the workloads come up and the workload essentially points to one of my Git projects, uh, that branch, that's it. And behind the scenes, what it's doing is it's running the build phase right now. And I can get in here and look at the logs right here. So it's creating that object that we were looking at earlier as well. And <clears throat> Pretty much the same thing. Build is done. I go back and then this is the new object that just came up for this application. And the deployment is coming up for right now. What I can do is also like visualize uh, using that tray. Um, with the tree of workload. So all these objects were spun up by the workload. Uh, and this red essentially means the build started it and it completed. So the pod is completed. Uh, it's not up right now, so it says false, but you, know, you get the idea that this shows me everything that got spun out out of this workload. All we are looking at on the right hand side is the pods that got spun up. Um, but uh, these are the other objects that get spun out. There's the application, the cap app, uh, the Git repo, the image object, the image object spins the build object, which spins in turn the pod. So you can look at everything here. Um, now going back to, to visualizing this, I'm going to go again, look up my Knative service. And it did give me the URL and I can go in my browser. So you see the other one was Java. This one is Tanzu Java web app. It's a different URL, same code, so uh, same message. Yeah, uh, before I wrap this up, I wanted to show how another uh, developer who's not the Java developer, he's a .NET developer. Um, she's a .NET developer. Um, and she is uh, now, again, leveraging the same, uh, same supply chain. Um, and let's look at what that YAML looks like. So it's the same stuff, uh, same workload type, just a different name for this workload, obviously. Uh, it's a K 
working on this object and pointing to a different branch. So the same thing happens um, for this guy as well. It brings up the build for, uh, <clears throat> uh, it starts to trigger the build for this one and you see that one's running right now and I can look at the logs. This is Kpack. Kpack in Kpack knows this is a .NET app. It's executing with the .NET build packs and creating uh, the image for us and will eventually pull. Um, what's also good about Kpack is it, um, it lets you look at the software it lets you look at the software bill of material, which I think increasingly is becoming more important and relevant. So this was the previous build that we ran and just want to show that how it is able to show you the software bomb. While we are waiting on this build to run, and you can clearly see I'm running on, <laughs> on a Kubernetes cluster that's screaming for more memory, but we'll make it work. So again, uh, now the tree, same, same stuff. Uh, got stamped out. So this is all cartographer stamping out these custom objects based on the supply chain template, um, supply chain blueprint and the templates that we had in the blueprint. Um, it will create all these objects. And finally, my URL. All right, so this is the .NET application now up and running on my cluster. So in summary, let, let's just do a quick recap of what we just saw. So we just saw that basic supply chain. So I just had one, two, three phases, and I could add more. And all I was doing was once this happened, which would be like already available in the system, it's a one-time thing, it's done and it's ready to go. And that's when the developers start interfacing uh, with the cartographer with uh, workload YAML. Uh, that's the 10 line uh, YAML that we saw. There's an opportunity to like parameterize things further and be able to pass along environment variables, dependency, service claims, like all of that good stuff. There's, there's an opportunity to do that in the workload YAML, but it'll still, be relatively smaller than what you'd have to do if you were on your own working with all of these different tools. So we, we did this, the cartographer controller picked it up, it matched the supply chain and then started to stamp out, stamp out objects. And as those objects came up, Kubernetes, uh, being Kubernetes, made sure that each of those objects re reached their desired stage and cartographer controller kept the watch going between the different objects that were stamped out. So uh, that's what the role of cartographer is. So it is watching this, the, um, the, the, the status change for the, each of the Kubernetes object that got spun out. So the image one is watching for the source, uh, deployment is watching for the image. And uh, we did see how it eventually deployed everything and made available. So that's that's the demo. Um, I wanted to share like a little bit on the documentation. So that's where you'd go to access more uh, or look at more uh, on Cartographer. Um, pretty neat documentation really. And there's a bunch of examples that are available out of the box. And you could just go in there, just um, 
look at each of these supply chains that are available. Um, what we did was a deployment. Uh, there, is an op there is an opportunity to also, and this, this is a live editor and I love it because you can put your supply chain and be able to view. And this particular supply chain, uh, which is what I wanted to show is it's writing to a Git repo. So with GitOps becoming also the standard more and more, um, the idea is to be able to use this, this construct. And if you want to deploy, if you're not at that, uh, uh, if, if you are not yet there with the GitOps model in your uh, deployments, that's fine, just deploy. But if you were to like push it to a Git repo, you can absolutely do that. Uh, use this Git, uh, Git writer, push it to an ops repo, and then have uh, the delivery uh, blueprint, which you'd have on your runtime clusters. The delivery blueprint would refer to the ops um, repo and be able to uh, run it on several clusters if you need it to. And I can show you another example here. So this is source, tester, image builder, and deployer. So that's pretty much it with that I would wrap. And if there are any questions, um, I'm on LinkedIn um, and reach me out uh, on LinkedIn if you have, but if you, um, or join, uh, join the Slack channel for Cartographer. Uh, Cartographer is a CNCF project as of March, 2022. So that would be another place. The Kubernetes Slack, Slack has a Cartographer channel. So you could join the conversation there, ask your questions there as well. So there's, uh, a, com there's a lot of uh, community folks who are also joining in answering questions over there. So I would also do that. With that, uh, we have about eight minutes to spare and a few folks. And Alex, did you want to talk about the openings that we have at Team Tanzu, if anybody wanted to join? I mean, you basically hit the nail on the head right there. We've got, uh, if any, if this tech seems interesting and you want to work with folks like Natasha, I work with her pretty regularly. Uh, we have plenty, plenty of openings. I know uh, certainly Natasha and I will happily help anyone that we can. Uh, so if there's anyone that we can help just kind of, you know, make a career change, get into the space, whatever it may be, let us know. We'll happily work with you. And since this is Women Who Code, I, being a woman working at VMware, it's an awesome place for you to be and grow. Uh, so do check out and hit me up, Alex up, if you like anything. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for the talk and the live demo. And thank you both for joining us today. Have a good weekend.